In the Shadow of the Valley by Maggot Mosh Pit Chapter 10 Arbalist sat atop the wall, looking out over the pitch-black field. Something within him told him things were going on. Perhaps it was the lack of insect song, or the voice he thought he heard on the wind. He looked over at Hex, an experienced warrior whose task it was to defend the walls. Sorry, something didn't seem right. Go on with what you were telling me. Hex answered in a gruff voice, fitting of his large stature and square face. You think something's afoot? It was nothing. A warrior's intuition is seldom wrong, my friend. Arbalist did not consider himself a warrior. Far from it. It was probably just an echo. Hex shrugged. Whatever you say. Anyway, the tower. They've got it rigged out with too much protection to burn. And the thing looked as solid as a rock. We don't stand a chance. Why not run? Hex did not make eye contact with Arbalist, nor did he with anyone else, for that matter. Most of the time he just looked to the horizon, or just stared at the wall. For some reason, Arbalist found this oddly comforting and intriguing. He wondered if Hex was blind, but his eyes did follow animals and sometimes people in the distance, so that was not a possibility. Hex shifted his paws on the battlements, sighing. There's nowhere to run to. To carry all the food we need to feed everyone, it would take carts, and Laxar we don't have. Not to mention how slow we would be. Not that we're any better off here. Arbalist didn't bother looking into Hex's face, knowing it would be almost impossible to read his minute emotions. So what will you do? You can't beat the felines, I agree with you there, but you have to do something to survive. What about Lin? What has he seen about your future? Hex let out a rare chuckle. <laughs> he says he hasn't seen our future, but I know he has. Like I said, we don't stand a chance. So he's just accepted his and his people's fate? Hex shifted off the battlements and moved down the wall. I don't know about Lin, but I have. Arbalist didn't quite understand, so he followed Hex. You're all going to die, and you're just lying down and taking it? Hex, without looking, reached over and flicked Arbalist's ear with his claw. Not lying down. I will die kicking and screaming. Attempting to halt the inevitable. That's very noble. But if I were you, I would run myself. Hex stopped. Really? Yeah, you're a big guy with plenty of experience. You could slip into the night and never be seen again. Ugh, a cowardly move. Besides, my life would have no meaning. I would be the last of my species. I see. We're a dying race anyway. A few weeks back, Niv gave birth to a baby boy. He died two days later of a small cut no one noticed. Bled out during the night. Oh. She hides her emotions from everyone under a mask of happiness. But they know the sorrow she feels. Everyone here has lost someone to the plague. What would have happened if the felines had never shown up? I suppose your people would die out naturally. Man, you guys have got it bad. Once again, like I said, I have accepted it. Arbalist gave himself a few minutes to digest all this, knowing Hex would not speak unless spoken to. Eventually, he found something to say. I suppose my species is in your situation too. Do you know how hard it is to find a mate and raise a kid on the streets? No. Do you? The question took Arbalist off guard, so much so he almost answered truthfully. Quickly, he swallowed. I don't know, just a thought. I don't see much of a future in my species either, I guess. Hex stopped Arbalist and sniffed the air. <laughs> Smell that. No. Hex narrowed his eyes on the horizon and sniffed once more. <laughs> Some sort of... He stopped again and sniffed deeply. Oil? Arbalist and Hex heard it at the same time. Something big was coming. At first, the rumbling of wooden wheels was the only thing audible. Then footfalls and faint voices. Hex quickly grabbed Arbalist's muzzle before he could scream bloody murder. Wait. 
Arbalest swatted Hex's paw away. Why? We'll get everyone ready, quiet-like. Line them up on the wall. Tell them to crouch and pretend we don't know they're there. He nodded, but stopped Hex before he ran off. What about the oil smell? What does it mean? They're probably going to try and burn down the gates with it. We'll put water buckets along the walls for the defenders. Beyond that, there isn't much we can do. Arbalist nodded, then followed Hex to wake the defenders. Zick had a grin on his face that would make a hyena blush. It had been a long time since he had been able to partake in a full-blown siege. Although his talents lay in tracking, he secretly liked open warfare. He had ordered total silence in the ranks, though by now the fort occupants would have detected the small army. He rode the tower and prepared himself for the ensuing battle. Tezar marched alongside Stonewall and Leol on the left flank of the army, the traditional position for commanding officers. Farrell ran towards them from somewhere past the fort. Sirs, the net is in place, Zip reports. What about my plan? Farrell nodded quickly. It has begun. Ziff has broken off the main force. I saw him while I was on my way back. Stonewall couldn't laugh for fear of the enemy hearing, so he chuckled softly. <laughs> I'm betting they won't expect what we've got in store. Heck, and I was just going to use the oil to burn the main gates. But what you've got is savagely brilliant. Leol growled. It'll be a treat to see those deviants burn. Martin sat with Lynn the vision he saw running through his mind. He shook his head, a feeling of dread prevailing in him. That couldn't be the future. It was terrifying. Oh, but it is, Martin. He looked at his paws, then placed them on the chair's arm, thinking for an instant his paws would pass through. The sky was. I do not have an explanation for you, my friend. I've seen that vision many times, and I still do not know its meaning. I only know you had to see it. What, what was everyone doing? Felines and canines. Mocked. It is against Rephrase's will. She will not allow that to. Why did you show me that? Lynn stood and walked over to Martin, patting his back. You will see. With that, Lynn left Martin to his thoughts. Martin's mind was racing too fast to sit. He paced the room endlessly, trying to work it all out. It couldn't be the future. Felines and canines getting along? Kissing? They weren't that kind of species. The only thing felines wanted was canines as slaves. They were only a blight to society. But what about Frey? Frey is a nice feline, Martin thought. He's different. Martin clasped his face in his paws and sat down. The confusion, double standards, terrible revelations, and the questions they rose, overwhelming him and driving him to weep openly. Lynn came downstairs to the commotion. As silently as they could, every able-bodied man and woman took up arms and swarmed out the doors to defend their home. Despite the flurry of activity, the actual number of defenders was staggeringly low. Lynn grabbed Hex's arm as he strode past. What's going on? Hex kept his eyes rooted to the doorway. The felines are attacking, Lynn. What? It's too soon. Hex shook Lynn off his arm and continued towards the door. Lynn looked around and called out. Niv! Niv, where are you? He ran through a door, deeper into the building. Kethresh was preparing to sleep. After she and Bronze had tried to inquire about the tapestry all day, without success, they decided to bid each other good night and sleep. However, the disturbance outside her door caused her to stop, redress, and grab her sword. Pushing the door open, she almost flattened Bronze with it. Whoa! Kathresh, they're attacking! Her fears were confirmed. Time for us to leave, then. Come on, we've got to find Martin and Arbalest. Bronze stopped her. Wait! We can't just leave them here. We need to help. I thought you said you didn't like to fight. Yes, I know. But I also like peace. I can tell that this was a very peaceful place when the felines weren't attacking it. It could be again if- Bronze, get your head out of fiction. These people are doomed. Bronze wagged a claw at her angrily. Don't say that so loud! 
Come on, we can fight them! No, we can't! We have to find Pill, not fight an impossible battle. These are monks. Maybe one or two actually know how to fight. Our only choice is to leave and continue on. But... Kethresh grabbed his wrist and dragged him behind her. Come on, I think Arbalest was on the wall. Probably doing exactly what he shouldn't. Arbalest was indeed doing exactly what he shouldn't. He was crouching with the defenders, ready to fight to the death with them. At the prospect of battle, he had completely forgotten about Martin and the reason they were there in the first place, instead being caught up in the bloodlust within him. Hex shuffled up next to him, his eyes dead set on the horizon, to where a vague shape could be seen rumbling towards them. There they are. Arbalist nodded. Give me a bow. A bow was pressed into his paws, but before he could pull it away, Hex clasped his paws. This isn't your fight, scavenger. Arbalist took the bow and grabbed an arrow from Hex's quiver. Any fight with felines was his fight. Hex sighed and addressed the defenders. Put arrows to strings and wait for my signal. They need to be closer. Silently, the red pandas readied their bows. Looking around, Arbalist could see the state they were in. Some muttered prayers, others just seemed totally terrified. He knew they weren't fighters, but they had to act the part regardless. Zick could see the wall looming, but something was off. No one was there to greet him and his army. He squinted at the wall and strained his ears, but the darkness and sound of marching drowned out all else. He smiled, realizing something. He crouched down to a pile of vibrantly colored flags that sat next to a large flaming brazier. Selecting the blue flag, he threw it up and waved it wildly. The effect had the appearance of a wave, the nearest felines hefting their mid-sized shields and raising them up, each soldier's neighbor doing the same. Soon, each soldier was holding their shields upwards, forming a protective screen against arrows. <laughs> One for me, nil for you. Hex heard the shields go up before he saw them. Cursing, he barked. Quickly, before they get their shields up, fire! Arbalist popped out and fired down into the dark at the scarcely illuminated soldiers below. His arrow thudded into a shield without much effect. Some of the arrows didn't even make it that far. Hex growled. Ah, damn it! I thought they would wait a few more minutes before realizing what was going on. Maintain fire! Maybe some will get through. Hex didn't sound very enthusiastic or optimistic. Despite this, the monks fired into the shield wall as fast as they could, some shafts still not even reaching the approaching army. Arbalist took aim again, this time aiming slightly lower at the more exposed front lines. His bow twanged, and a scream rang out to reward his effort. Hex could see the army quite clearly. Contrary to popular belief, his vision was excellent. He stared at the tower rumbling towards them, and you could see Zick poking his head from the tower. Even from the incredible distance, they locked eyes. Zick ducked back into the cover of his tower. The intensity of the stare sent shivers down his spine. Shaking off the feeling, he glanced back, judging the distance he was from the wall. He readied a yellow flag and tried to avoid Hex's death stare. Martin had fallen asleep, although he wouldn't admit it to anyone. He was shaken from his sleep by shouts outside his room. Sitting up slowly, he rubbed the grogginess from his eyes. The agitation from his earlier experience still bothered him, but the immediate urgent atmosphere was foremost in his mind. He pushed the door open and peered out into the dining room. It was dark, very dark. He grabbed the candle from where he had been sleeping and stepped across the room. Zick saw the distance was right and hoisted the flag into the air. He watched the planes just past the fort carefully. Surely another yellow flag raised and waved around. Zick smiled and grabbed a crossbow. Martin was glancing out the window when he saw the yellow flag. The giant building inside the fort was taller than the walls, so Martin could see everything just below them. Momentarily he saw sparks, and before he could react, the plane below his window lit up with a dozen more dots of fire. The felines set their fire arrows to their bows and took aim. Martin tensed up and ran for the door. The building was made up of mostly wood. 
He ignored the thunking of arrows soaked with oil hitting the building's roof and ran out into the hall. Niv was running down the hall, lugging a giant broadsword. Niv! Felines! We're, we're under attack! I know. I need help. Martin grabbed her, stopping her in her tracks. No! We need to run! They've started burning the monastery! She dropped the sword and gasped. What? How? Fire arrows. They... they just shot them into the building. Niv pushed past Martin and turned a corner, shouting. We need to get water! Noticing Martin was not following her, she peeked back around the corner, tears beginning to form in her eyes. Come on, we need to hurry! We need to run! We're outnumbered, and that fire will spread too fast! I can't leave Lynn! As if on cue, Lynn rounded the corner. Upon spotting Niv, he pushed past Martin and grabbed her, holding her to his chest protectively. Niv! Everything is falling apart! Oh, Lynn, what can we do? There isn't much. He noticed Martin standing there, looking bewildered. You can't stay here. You'll perish. You need to run. Come with me. Remember the future I showed you? Did you see a single red panda among the people? Now that it was mentioned, there wasn't a single one. That doesn't mean- Your friends are looking for you. Go! There isn't a future for our kind. There never was. Think of your future, Martin. Fly! He stood, unwilling. Lynn growled and pushed him. Go! At last, Martin moved down the hall. Glancing back, he saw the couple still embracing. Lynn was whispering something into Niv's ear as Martin turned the corner. He never saw them again. Kethresh and Bronze were running across the courtyard when Bronze stopped. Wait, do you smell smoke? Yes, I do. They looked around and saw the flames engulfing a portion of the roof. Bronze yelled without thinking. Holy shit! The monastery is on fire! This exclamation caused panic among the defenders, who were too focused to notice the flames. Half of them turned around to look, and upon seeing their home on fire, abandoned the battlements to go fight the flames instead. Hex shouted at them, but to no avail. Hey! Come back here! It's too late to stop the blaze! Arbalist looked over as someone grabbed Hex and shook him. Our families are in there, Hex. We need- Hex slapped him across the face. If those felines reach us, you think they're gonna wait for you? The man shook Hex off. Doesn't matter anyway, we're all doomed! Arbalist fired another shot at the felines, addressing Hex. Morale ultimately decides an army's strength, he said, matter-of-factly. Hex sighed, drew back his bow, and aimed down the shaft. And you said you weren't a warrior. He let loose, transfixing another feline who fell silently. Arbalest was about to continue the banter when a paw clamped on his shoulder. Arbalest, what the hell are you doing? He didn't look back. He just shrugged off the paw and fitted another arrow to his bow. What does it look like, Kathresh? Bronze spoke up as well. This is crazy, you know. Come on, we need to leave. Coward. He let loose and once again drew back the bow. At least I'm not suicidal. We came here to meet Lin, not to die. Funny how that works out. How everything you plan goes horribly wrong. He fired again. Stonewall's army was outfitted with crossbows that had less range than the monks' longbows. And although the Red Pandas enjoyed the superior range for some minutes, the feline army's rear guard of crossbowmen were now in range of the wall. As Zick stood, bursting with energy, Tezar climbed into the moving platform and tapped his shoulder. Sir, I want to be the first on the wall. Of course. Up you go. Tezar climbed the ladder and joined the small group on top. Zick gleefully hopped about waving a red flag, and the crossbowmen opened fire. Kethresh heard the death crescendo of strings, and her finely honed reflexes took over. Grabbing arbalist and bronze by the neck, she dove to the ground. As the three hit the stones, the bodies of some of the defenders began to as well. Arbalist freed himself and sprung up, outraged. What was- He saw the carnage around him. A good portion of the defenders lay dead, the rest cowered low on the wall. Hex was still firing coolly, however. Kethresh stood and grabbed Arbalist, a pleading look in her eyes. What, do you have a death wish? He looked around again, 
then snapped out of his bloodlust. What? Bronze was counting. Guys, they'll start firing again in a few seconds! Arbalist made a beeline for the stairs that ran along the wall, Gathrash being pulled along. Soon all three were dashing across the courtyard towards a smaller, thicker door built into the opposite wall. Kethresh stopped them. Where is Martin? Arbalist glanced around. He must still be inside. I'll get him. Hold on. He dashed towards the building and disappeared inside. Kethresh and Bronze watched with helpless terror as more and more red pandas fell to the feline's arrows. With a crash, a portion of the roof collapsed, and a ghastly scream rang out into the night. Everything was going to hell, and it was only getting worse. After a time, the tower thudded against the wall, and a metal appendage swung down from its top, hooking onto the battlements. The remaining wall defenders scattered as a group of felines swarmed the battlements. Bronze watched as Hex single-handedly held off the felines on one side, as the narrow walkway meant only two could attack him at a time. The other direction was totally open. Yelling war cries and waving swords, the felines stormed down the stairs into the courtyard. Kathresh, here they come. She drew her sword. The red pandas fought back, but soon began to fall under the better-trained feline soldiers. Only twenty or so came over the wall, a few spotting Kathresh and Bronze. Oi! There's some! Easily sidestepping a thrust from one, Kathresh tripped the unfortunate cat and ran him through. The next came for Bronze, who held up his flat blade, parrying a slash. Flipping the blade around so he struck with the blunt end, he swung in a wide arc, smacking the soldier in the head. He went down. Arbalist dashed out of the building with Martin in tow, swinging Martin's curved sword. He slashed at anyone who got in his way, and soon he had joined them, panting. All right, let me get this door open. Martin! He offered the sword back, and Martin took it. Tezar dispatched another red panda and wiped her brow. Looking across the courtyard, she spotted Martin. She felt the blood rise in her, and charged with a yell. Martin felt a chill run through him as Tezar charged. He didn't know how to sword fight, so he stepped back towards the door. Uh, Arbalist? It's stuck! Kethresh intercepted Tezar, and their swords locked together. Tezar was using a two-handed bastard sword, smaller than Kethresh's sword. She hopped back and growled. Get out of the way, dog! This is between me and the wolf! Kethresh stepped forward and readied her blade. She did not bait or taunt Tezar, simply standing ready. With a yell, Tezar cleaved the air above her, swinging powerfully at Kethresh's head. Angling her sword, Kethresh held it over her and watched as Tezar's blade slid off harmlessly with a clang. Tezar quickly slashed at Kethresh's flank. In her haste, she had made a terrible mistake. Kethresh saw this and smiled, letting go of her own sword and grasping the handle of Tezar's, twisting it expertly out of her paws. Tezar stood, unable to believe the ease at which Kethresh had disarmed her. Never cross your paws like that. With a smack of the blade, Tezar was out cold. Arbalist yelled with triumph. Ha! Got it! With a creak, the door swung wide, and all four travelers dashed out into the night. Hex once again locked eyes with Zick. This time, the two were face to face on the wall. Zick was laughing. Hex was not. <laughs> I see you're not a regular fighter. You've laid low a few of our men. Hex's eyes were empty of emotion, devoid of fear. Zick knew this would not be an easy fight. His soldiers stood behind him, uneasy. Zick stepped forward, speaking to one of the soldiers behind him. Burn the gate! Let the rest of our men in! The soldier nodded and climbed back onto the tower. Hex was armed with a bloody short sword, while Zick had an equally bloody short sword. With a lunge, Zick attacked. Hex countered and thrusted towards Zick's chest. Zick was expecting this, however, and quickly brought his sword in a path in front of him, swatting the thrust aside. Following the same motion, he slashed downwards, only to slash thin air. Hex, dodging away, slashed across Zick's side, drawing blood. Zick jumped back quickly. Ah! You hit me! Impressive! He motioned to the soldiers behind him. Shoot him! Hex had no desire to be shot. 
Flinging his sword at the first archer, he sidestepped the second's bolt, as the first fell, stuck like an insect on a spit. Pushing the archer off the wall before he could ready his sidearm, Hex dove onto Zick's back. Together they tumbled off the wall into the courtyard, landing in a heap with a crunch. Martin was panting, driving himself onward towards the woods beyond the plain. However, there was something off. He stopped and held up his paw. Wait. What? Why are we stopping? I see it too. A tiny fire could be seen. After a few seconds, it disappeared. Felines. Zip stamped on the torch once more to make sure it was out. Idiot! I said no fires! The soldier groaned. This whole thing was pointless anyway. No one will escape. The look in Zip's eye told the soldier to shut up. He was about to continue berating the unfortunate man, but was cut off when all four fugitives blew through the camp without stopping, disappearing into the dark as soon as they had appeared. All was still for an instant before Zip yelled, After them! The soldiers scrambled up and dashed off after the four. Rita woke suddenly. Harimau glanced over at her. Something the matter? She shivered. Um, just a nightmare. Care to tell? She shook her head, watching the torchlight play off passing shrubs. Harimau understood. All right. You know the day of flame is coming up in a day and a night. Yes. But we'll miss it, probably. He nodded sadly. Yes, it's true. We should be. Our kin and bronze will most likely be missing it as well. Trey hammered away at the small stand, nailing in the last plank for the food vendor. It was very late, but Frey wanted to finish this stand before he called it a night. He heard a sound and turned around, seeing Halen approaching. Frey. Halen, greetings. Something was clearly bothering Halen, but he smiled nonetheless. I wanted to hammer out some details of our plan. Frey stood and patted his shoulder. Don't worry, friend. We have everything planned out already. It's going to work. But who will take the blame? For the poisoning? I will. I owe this community that much. Halen nodded weakly. Frey, you don't have to- No, I do have to. I have to make a point, as well as stopping the regent. Halen, racked with guilt but unable to do anything, grabbed Frey's shoulder. I'm sorry, brother. For what? Getting you into this. Nonsense. This is for the greater good, right? Yeah.